The Indian workers who built the first railroad to Uganda attracted Indian shopkeepers who sold to them. These Indian shopkeepers remained after the railroad was completed, selling not only to their countrymen but also to the British and, primarily, to the much larger indigenous African population. In many cases, these Indian shops were the first permanent commercial retail establishments the African villagers had ever encountered. The Asians in East Africa were also the first to import and sell cereal. They served as middlemen who bought the African farmers' produce for cash on the spot and assumed responsibility for its marketing. While there were some European wholesalers, Indians conducted the bulk of the retail trade with African natives. They transformed East Africa from a largely subsistence and barter economy into a money economy. Taxes were paid in kind in Uganda until the turn of the century, but were paid thereafter in money. Rupees. A young Winston Churchill, after touring Africa, wrote of the Indian trader in Africa who was penetrating and maintaining himself in all sorts of places to which no white man would go. A 1905 report in Kenya declared that fully 80% of the present capital and business energy of the country is Indian. A 1919 report in Kenya declared that the Indians were firmly established in all the leading towns and districts. Indians collected and purchased virtually all the cotton crop in Uganda, and by 1919 had built 17 cotton gins there. They also built flour mills in Kenya, and one Indian trader alone exported 20 tons of Kenyan maize. As late as 1948, Indians owned about 90% of all cotton gins in Uganda. Numerous contemporary observers commented that Europeans simply could not compete with the small Indian trader, either in the city or in the bush. Throughout East Africa, the Indian operated on a very small profit margin, lived extremely cheaply, took the risks of selling on credit, and worked long hours in remote places under what would be impossible conditions for Europeans. He was, in short, performing an economic function which no one else was available to perform a point also noted by various contemporary observers. A British observer in the 1920s commented on the Indians driving their trucks, often without lights, without brakes, apparently without tires, and with an engine which looks like conking out at any moment, pushing trade through the most inaccessible places. Most Indians in Uganda were and remained small retailers, petty money lenders, and the like but Indians were also disproportionately represented among the few large-scale entrepreneurs of the country. Two large Indian conglomerates, Madhvani and Company and Mehta Sons, were based on sugar production, but the former also spread out to encompass cornmeal, soap, margarine, beer, glass, and other products, while the latter included tea, iron, engineering products, and electrical equipment among their products. Both firms began in Uganda cotton production and spread across international boundaries as well as across industrial fields. There were no African entrepreneurs of comparable scope or magnitude. While Indian business and financial relations with Africa go back for centuries, and many Indian businessmen in Africa have had family, trading, and banking relations with India, the wealthy Indian businessmen of Africa were not simply people who transferred their wealth from India. Virtually all the wealthy Indian businessmen in Africa made their fortunes in Africa, usually from humble beginnings, sometimes as indentured laborers. One of the earliest business magnates on the African mainland was Alidina Visram, who rose from a small caravan trader to develop a business empire with more than 30 branches in East Africa, stretching from Dar es Salaam in Tanganyika to the Kenyan port of Mombasa, and across hundreds of miles to Uganda's port of Entebbe, on Lake Victoria. He also had land investments in almost every town developing in early Kenya and Uganda, a fleet of sailing vessels on Lake Victoria, and he pioneered in cart transport services on land as well. That this was not merely self-perpetuating wealth was underscored by the future of this financial empire after his death. Two generations later, the firm was bankrupt, with his family appealing to the government for financial aid. Most Indians in Uganda were nowhere near the economic levels of the Madhvanis or the Metas, though they were somewhat more prosperous than the indigenous Africans. Still, about half the Indians in Uganda owned their own businesses. 
The enormous economic role of Indians in transforming the economies of East Africa is all the more remarkable because of their relatively small number in proportion to the total populations of those countries. At the peak of their population size in Uganda in the late 1960s, Indians, Pakistanis, and Goans together added up to fewer than 100,000 people in a nation of more than 8 million. They were just over 1% of the population. The Asian population was, of course, much smaller in the earlier years, though rapidly growing, both through natural increase and by immigration, much of it by the successive bringing over of family members by those already settled in Africa. As of the early 1920s, there were between 5,000 and 6,000 Asians in Uganda. This more than doubled in a decade, and after World War II, there were 35,000 in 1948, growing to about 63,000 by 1956. As with the Chinese, the Jews, and other middleman minorities around the world, the economic contributions and success of the Indians in Africa have been in sharp contrast with the social and political opposition they have encountered. European settlers, who generally arrived in Uganda after the Indians, were their earliest and most vocal critics. During World War I, Europeans were able to get government controls and restrictions on the cotton industry introduced, with the net effect of benefiting Europeans who were having difficulties competing with the Indians. However, anti-Asian feeling has generally been less in Uganda than in Kenya. Nevertheless, such antagonism grew as the passing years saw the emergence of small native African businessmen and some educated Africans in Uganda, both of whom aspired to positions in the economy and in the civil service already held by Indians. These African groups tended to be anti-Indian in outlook and to try to turn other Africans against the Indians. As of 1952, there were more than twice as many African traders as Indian traders in Uganda, but non-African traders, mostly Indians, did an estimated three times as much business as the Africans. This was despite governmental regulations which hampered non-Africans from setting up shops in some locations. At the same time, Indians owned approximately 90% of the cotton gins in Uganda, many purchased from Europeans in financial trouble between the two world wars. Most of the cotton produced in Uganda was sent to Bombay. All 34 cottonseed oil mills in Uganda were also owned by Indians. More than three-quarters of all factories in Uganda were likewise owned by Indians. In government employment, however, Indians were very much a minority. Europeans dominated the senior civil service, and Africans dominated the junior civil service, with Indians being less than one-fifth of the latter. The numerical predominance of African traders may have had little economic significance, but it provided political force to anti-Indian feelings. High rates of business failures among the African traders fed their resentment of the Indians, whose own high failure rates in the past were seldom remembered. After the mid-1950s, open hostility to Indian traders spread among Africans, sometimes expressed in destruction and looting. The first major anti-Indian trade boycott in East Africa took place in Uganda in 1959, lasting seven months, and involved race riots and the burning down of the farms of those African peasants who did not adhere to the boycott of the Indians. It was a foretaste of what was to come in the next decade. These and other anti-Asian outbursts in the years preceding Uganda's independence in 1962 left the Indian population ambiguous as to their future in general and their immediate citizenship decisions in particular. They could apply for Ugandan citizenship or seek various forms of British protection or remain stateless. About 30,000 Asians applied for Ugandan citizenship under the 1962 constitution, but years later, more than half their applications were still pending. Uganda's 1967 constitution included a grandfather clause under which even native-born people could become citizens only if one of their parents or grandparents had been citizens, clearly an obstacle created to block Indians from achieving citizenship. At the same time, restrictions on non-citizens in government employment and in the private economy were used to Africanize Uganda in accordance with prevailing post-independence ideology. The number of Asians in Uganda's civil service declined from about 2,000 in 1961 to about 1,300 by 1968, even though the bureaucracy itself was growing rapidly. 
Restrictions were also placed on how much money emigrants could take out of the country with them. Government jobs were particularly prized. They paid substantially more than the average wage in private industry. In both sectors, however, Asians earned several times the income of Africans, even after Ugandan independence, though much less than Europeans earned. Still, there were far more Asians than Europeans, so that more job opportunities for Africans were to be had by displacing Asians. Many of the Asians also had no place to go and no government to protect them, so that they were an easier target. In the days when India was a colony of Great Britain, the British colonial government in India did not hesitate to intervene on behalf of Indians in Africa. But after India's independence, its government's international role as a leader in third world politics made India unwilling to offend African or other third world governments by championing the rights of Indians in these countries. Indians in Uganda became pawns in political games, domestic and international. The final tragedy for Indians in Uganda came with the rise to power of Idi Amin. His grossness and butchery were imposed on Ugandans by force, but much of the rest of the world, and especially African leaders, shared a certain complicity for their good-natured tolerance of Amin as an anti-colonialist who could twist the nose of whites. As one journalist wrote, the world chuckled, Africans applauded, and Ugandans died often at the rate of 100 to 150 a day. Amin directed a special venom toward the Asians. He accused them, among other things, of both overpricing and undercutting, and warned of dire consequences if they did not collectively mend their ways. In August 1972, he ordered 50,000 Asians expelled, citizens and non-citizens alike, and severely limited how much money, 55 pounds, they could take with them. The Asian population of Uganda, which had been 96,000 in 1968, was estimated at only 1,000 at the end of 1972. Many landed destitute in England or in whatever other countries would take them. The economic role of the Indians in Uganda can perhaps best be appreciated by considering what happened after they left. The economy collapsed. The Asian shops were often simply turned over to Amin's favorites, who sold everything and then closed them down. The confiscated wealth was not simply redistributed. The total wealth of the country was diminished. In agriculture, the Asians' coffee and tea plantations, which required constant care, were neglected after their departure and became breeding grounds for deadly tsetse flies. Ugandan soldiers who smuggled the coffee across Uganda and into Kenya helped spread sleeping sickness and make it a major health hazard in the region again. As of 1972, at least 35% of Uganda's national output was produced by Asians, with some estimates ranging to more than half. Twenty years after the expulsions of the Asians from Uganda, the economy still had not recovered from the havoc created by those expulsions. According to the head of Uganda's own Chamber of Commerce, most of the Africans who took over the running of former Asian businesses were untrained and became business failures. With cracked and crumbling streets in the capital city of Kampala, and with half-completed construction sites still untouched since 1972, economic desperation and pressure from the World Bank and other Western aid donors led the Ugandan government to seek the return of Asian businessmen. Efforts to attract these exiled businessmen have centered on the restoration of the thousands of confiscated properties belonging to them. Yet relatively few of the Indians and Pakistanis returned from abroad to reclaim their businesses. The hostile environment of Uganda made returning there an unattractive option. Despite the economic losses suffered by Ugandans as a result of the expulsions of the Asians, resentments against Indians and Pakistanis remained high. In addition to this more or less spontaneous animosity, there was organized opposition to the return of the Asians by those Africans who had taken over their businesses. The Uganda African Trade Movement issued a public statement plainly stating that its members intend to wage an atrocious war everywhere in Uganda on any Asian returnee. Lest there be any doubt, the statement continued, We intend to harm, maim, cause them a lot of suffering even killing them in the most despicable way ever, if they don't leave our land and country immediately. 
As in so many other settings, economic productivity has provoked political antagonism, especially in the case of middleman minorities.